Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So, good uh, morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can still hear me. Yes, very good. Uh, any questions about uh, the last lecture? Well, if something comes, um, if you remember something as you go, just don't hesitate to unmute and ask me. So, uh, let me start with some reminders from the last lecture. So here, equation one is our favorite Schwarzschild metric, but written in a funny form. Well, it's written in the 
uh, Kruskal Sekeris coordinates. And uh, this part here uh, is uh, so 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 you can write it either in this so-called double null coordinates you had v hat as a, as a simple product, but then if you introduce capital T and capital X coordinates, then this part can be rewritten like that. There is this prefactor here, which is a bit funny. So this is this function e to minus 2 over m, uh, 32m cubed, who cares, some number divided by over r. And so r here is an implicit function of, uh, of the variables u hat and v hat, a smooth function of these variables. Um, let's see, uh, the singularity r equals 0 is located at the set u hat v hat equal 1, which in the x hat and t hat coordinates corresponds to two hyperbola. I mean, of course, these curves are not wiggly as I've drawn here. They're just uh, real nice hyperbola, but I uh, drew them in a wiggly way to emphasize the fact that this is a singularity, right? So r equals zero is uh, a singular set. So you, you want to feel this in the picture, so it's wiggly. The horizons r equal to m are on the diagonal in this uh, tx coordinates. Um, and then uh, this would be uh, our world here. And uh, r louder than 2m. And everything else is extensions. So uh, this is a black hole region. This is the white hole region. And this is another copy of our world. Good, so that's what we saw last time. And uh, I probably don't need the, you can write explicitly the formula how you go from the Schwarzschild coordinates r, t, or theta phi to those, but uh, hopefully I will not need this formula today. The only thing I, I need is, uh, is uh, uh, this thing, right? So r equals zero is the boundary of the region where the metric is well defined and we are living in, well, the, the metric, the manifold is uh, this subset of the plane times a uh, two-dimensional sphere for the angles, and uh, that's the uh, kruskov sekeres extension. Good. So, uh, there is... Uh, We've seen last time that uh, we have two copies of our world. And in fact, uh, we have, uh, for each constant time slice uh, in our world, we have two copies of it. And uh, this is a geometry which is called the uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge. So, right, so we, we are done with the reminders and we start today's lecture. Um, so, how does it work? Before I explain you what the Einstein-Rosen bridge is in this context, uh, let me tell you something uh, uh, about induced metrics, right? Preliminary is... induced metrics. So suppose that we have a metric in four dimension and suppose that uh, uh, sigma is a, a hypersurface uh, given by a, an equation uh, say one of the coordinates say x xn is equal f of x1 Xn. So this is a hypersurface in a, well in your manifold, and the manifold is a, uh, oops. So let's see. So uh, this should be n minus one, right? So one coordinate le less. So so we have a, a hypersurface which is a graph uh, in your manifold. So you can 
think of this as follows, right? So we have this xn coordinates here, so n is n-dimensional. Uh, and uh, we have the coordinates x1, xn minus 1. And so, so your hypersurface is some kind of graph here. Okay, so this is your sigma, so a graph of a function f. And now there is a notion of induced metric on sigma, and uh, which goes as follows, right? So suppose that g is a metric on m. And you want to capture this property of this hypersurface. So, of course, every occurrence of so g over sigma uh, you, is obtained by uh, doing two things. First, uh, dxn is replaced by df. Right? Since dxn is f, then its differential should be df, which is, of course, uh, df over dxi dxi over our coordinates. And, of course, xxn as is replaced by, uh, by f. Okay, so this is how you induce the metric from higher dimensions, so you have a, a metric on this higher dimensional manifold, well, n-dimensional manifold, you have a hypersurface, which is, has one dimension less than the induced metric is obtained in this way. So, um, later in the course, I will tell you a, a, a proper way of defining this. This is some kind of kitchen uh, recipe at this stage. By the way, maybe I should have used this microphone to start with. Is the sound better now or worse? Or the same? It's better? Same? Worse? Worse? A little better. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, yes, so that's uh, just a, a kitchen recipe how to do this. And uh, a proper way, we'll see it later. We don't need much more at this stage. So, as an example, uh, If we take uh, Schwarzschild uh, and we take uh, sigma to be t equals zero, uh, and r larger than 2m, of course, and then you can check that this is the same as uh, capital T equals zero and uh, x positive. So, in other words, this would be, our sigma would be here. Uh, then, uh, well, so then t equal is zero, and uh, so then the dt is equal to zero as well, right? Uh, according to this prescription. So, if I just take the Schwarzschild metric in its usual form, minus v dt square plus uh, dr square over v plus r square d omega square, then this metric uh, g induced on sigma, well, you have to drop the dt part, drop dt, because dt is zero, and so you get uh, and, uh, well, set t equals 0 everywhere, but uh, nothing depends upon t in the Schwarzschild matrix. So v is 1 minus uh, 2m over r. So uh, whether you set t to 0 or not, it's still the same function. So you're going to get this uh, dr square over 1 minus 2m over r plus r square the omega square, okay? So this is the metric induced by the Schwarzschild metric 
on the slice t equals 0, or in fact on any of the slices t equal constant. Okay? So this is the exterior world, and we have this hypersurface here, which ends at, the, uh, at this uh, uh, set, which is, by the way, called uh, the bifurcate killing horizon. There is a fancy way for this, uh, but never mind. Uh, this is a... Maybe I'll explain to you later why, where the terminology is coming from, but this is called a bifurcate. Bifurcate because it has two pieces, and killing horizon because this has something to do with the killing vectors. Good. So we have this uh, geometry here, and we're wondering, well, how does it come that this, uh, in this louder space-time, the surface uh, capital T equals zero extends nicely here, and this doesn't look like it wants to extend at all, uh, we have the usual problem that r equal to m is a zero here, uh, so we're going to get a problem when trying to uh, to extend that. But the point is that then this this can be extended uh, directly as follows: extend uh, g restricted to sigma by first introducing a new coordinate. And uh, if I remember it correctly, let me just, uh, let's do the calculation and see if it works. We're going to set rho is equal, uh, uh, let's see. No, I think it's probably, it's better that I just copy this here so that we don't get into troubles. Okay, square root of r square minus 4m, okay? And... Um, so, so, in other words, you change the coordinate r to a new coordinate rho, which is equal to that. And now this rho is a principle defined uh, is positive. Now remember that r is louder than 2m here. So this is uh, well defined, of course. Uh, uh, if r goes to 2m, then r squared minus 4m goes to 0. So, well... And then rho goes to zero, uh, but is not equal to zero because r, r is not equal uh, allowed to be equal to m. And so let's see what happens with this uh, uh, metric on the slices of the Schwarzschild spacetime when we do this. Ah, uh -huh, disaster. My machine doesn't work. How come? Okay, well, let's try to leave without the... suction. Hmm. Why is it not working? Sorry about this, uh, just a second. Well, giving up, we'll have to leave like that. It's, uh, 
ecologically much more responsible not to charge this thing anyway. So, um, good. So, uh, good. So, this is a simple calculation now. Uh, so, we make this change of coordinates. Uh, so, let's see. So, we can calculate d rho is. Uh, uh, good, I have to differentiate this function. So from the, uh, well, I get 2r dr by differentiating whatever is under the square root. And the square root gives me 2 times whatever there was here, which is 2r dr over, well, the 2 goes away, but uh, 2 rho. So, uh, we can therefore calculate dr square. And let me just uh, immediately divide it by v. So, the twos go away, and I get rho square over r square uh, times 1 minus 2m over r. All right, so this is v, and dr is uh, dr is rho rho d rho over r, so square d rho square d rho square over r square. Good. So now r square is easy. So it's uh, r square minus or m. Uh, one r I can absorb here. I get r times r minus 2m d rho square. And, uh, but this thing factors out as r minus 2m r plus 2m. So this r minus 2m factor which was the annoying thing, right? So r minus 2m is always the bad guy. Uh, this one is going to cancel out. And so we get r plus 2m over r. No, too fast. Um, Well, <laughs> like that, right? So r minus 2m cancels out uh, d rho square. So r over r is 1. And r, aha, uh -huh, I can calculate r from here. Uh, so let me just do this calculation. Uh, in this region, when I square this, I get rho square equal r square minus 4m. So r carry this to the other side and take a square root. Well, there are two square roots, plus and minus, but remember that we started in the R louder than 2m region and m is positive, uh, otherwise there's no horizon. Maybe I should, uh, well, that was certainly something that we want to assume. Um, yes? I, I have a question, maybe I'm yeah? looking something, but is r minus 2m and r plus 2m, then we would have r squared minus 4m squared, right? Of course. Very good. Thank you. Square here. Okay, thank you. Square here. Square here. Thank you very much. Hope it's correct in the in the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Just un the units will not work, right? So m has to be the same uh, unit as distance. So you, you need an m square here. Thanks for catching this. 
So, yeah, so one big mistake today. Okay, let me put a mistake counter one. Good. Uh, anyway, so coming back to this, we get r plus 2m over r. r over r is the 1. 2m over r, 2m over square root of 4m square plus rho square, 0 square. Good. So we compare our matrix here, right? So this was this part. which becomes this. This was defined only for r larger than 2m, and which meant rho is larger than 0. But now we can extend to all rho, because now this thing is a smooth function uh, for all rho, right? So extend to, to all rho. So, and this is called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. So you have this metric on the three-dimensional slices, which uh, was defined initially in one uh, asymptotic flat region. And now we have actually two regions, because we have a region rho goes to plus infinity, and we have a rho goes to minus infinity, and they're connected by uh, by a bridge. Of course, uh, since we already know the kruskal sekeres picture, we know what this means, right? So rho negative would be uh, sitting here, obviously, um, on the negative side. So this would be a continuation of sigma to rho negative. And we know that this, may, this part of the world is isometric to this one. Then obviously, uh, this continuation must be isometric to this one. But, uh, but here, uh, this is uh, straightforward to see anyway, because rho uh, going to minus rho is an isometry. Right? Why is it an isometry? Well, it means the metric doesn't change. Right? So if we change rho to minus rho, then r doesn't change, then uh, this doesn't change, while d rho changes a sign, but here we have d rho square, right? so this sign doesn't matter, so this whole thing doesn't change. The metric had also, well, the angular piece, but we already saw that r doesn't change, so this part doesn't change, and we just saw that this part doesn't change. Okay? So this is an isometry, so we have two exactly identical, metrically identical regions, which are connected together by a bridge, a space, a space bridge. Right? So you can think of, uh, and this is called, this extended geometry, where you're allowing rho to be in R is the Einstein-Rosen extension here. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I, I just, uh, too much to my shame, I, I don't remember, I haven't checked that, but I think that uh, when Einstein-Rosen wrote uh, this Einstein-Rosen bridge, they didn't know about the kruskal sekeres picture, right? So they just observed that there is this way of extending the constant T slices in Schwarzschild to a double copy of it, uh, but they were probably not aware of this picture. I, I'm, I'm not sure I don't want to uh, make uh, a definitive claim here, but, um, but I think that's, that's the case. Good, so let's see. So, so that's the Einstein-Rosen bridge story. Uh, a closely related uh, Observation is a one done by a colleague from Vienna, which is called the uh, Mr. Flam, and uh, his 
left his name in physics for uh, uh, in the context of a, something called the flam paralo, paraboloid. Okay, so that's what we are going to do shortly now. Uh, so this was, uh, I wish I, I, I should have checked the year. I probably have this in the, in the lecture notes, but so uh, this was a physicist from Vienna uh, ways back. And uh, this flam paraboloid story arises from the following question. Uh, how to visualize the geometry of the slices t equal constant in, of the Schwarzschild metric? So this is uh, the question, is there a simpler way of visualizing this geometry? Uh, and the thinking is, uh, well, how do I visualize the geometry of a sphere? Well, I embed it in R3, and I have a nice object in R3, and I can understand how vectors you know, can be moved around uh, this metric, and uh, I can understand its isometry symmetries just by looking at the embedding. So. In other words, a sphere of any dimension, you can always embed it in uh, Rn, where n is one dimension higher. And Flam asked the question, what will happen if I try to embed the geometry of t equal zero slices in Schwarzschild into four dimensions, right? So, but into four-dimensional Euclidean space. So this is the flam question. Uh, if I have to help me with the numbering here, so this is paragraph something point something. If I'm correct, it should be 4.7. 4.7. Thanks a lot. So flam parabol paraboloid. And so the question is, visualize the geometry of uh, constant time slices so uh, so this is uh, obtained by dropping time in the standard form of the metric. So uh, let's go back to the usual form that we just had before doing the Einstein-Rosen bridge uh, by embedding into a, a flat R4. So, of course, you can embed this constant time slices as t equals 0 in the Schwarzschild manifold. Right? That's how we actually found them. And the embedding is just saying, well, take t equals 0 or capital T equals 0, and that's uh, your embedding. But, but this geometry, well, is fairly complicated. It's hard to visualize it. Now, here, we're going to embed it into flat R4. Right? So, we, we have a flat 4, so this four-dimensional flat metric delta is going to be dx1 square plus dx2 square plus dx3 square plus, so it's all pluses, a dz square variable. And we're going to look at an embedding so that z uh, is equal a function of R. Well, we rewrite this x1, x2, x3 part of the metric uh, 
in spherical coordinates, right? So we just write dr square plus r square d omega square plus dz square. So uh, the embedding is z is equal f of r. Then what is the induced metric here? Uh, so uh, this metric delta, uh, so let's call this uh, sigma f. So the metric induced on sigma f, well, the rule is every z appearing in this metric replaced by f, but there's no z, so this one is easy. But then dz should be replaced by df, which is f prime dr. So when you do this, then this term will become f prime dr square. So if you collect now these terms dr square, you're going to get 1 from here and f prime square dr square plus r square d omega square. Okay. So take any spherically symmetric graph of this form or hypersurface of this form in R4. If you take, give me a function f, this is the induced metric on this thing, right? Whatever f is, uh, then you're going to have an induced metric to look like that. And now the question is, can I arrange things so that this is equal g sigma, right? So can this be equal to dr square over 1 minus 2m over r? plus r square d omega square. So, uh, well, this part is already taken care of. There's nothing to do here. So the only thing to match uh, is this part. And this is f prime square. So we just have an equation for f prime here, right? Which we need to solve. So let's uh, try to solve this equation. Uh, let me continue erasing here. Um, Yes, yeah, so well, without this suction business, it is a bit annoying. It just occurred to me that I can't wait to go to the hairdresser. Uh, I mean, this uh, setup is fortunate so that uh, you don't really see my hair. It's probably it's blending with the background. Because if I look at my hair in the mirror, that's the length of hair I used to have maybe uh, 
well, I don't want to tell you how long ago, but uh, when I was 16 or so. But this is the length I had when I was 16, when going out from a hairdresser, not going to a hairdresser. So, uh, different times. Uh, doesn't make my, me feel younger either. So I can't, uh, of course, wait to go to a hairdresser, but I just uh, didn't want to to join the crowd yesterday. Uh, everyone fighting to spread his coronavirus at hairdressers, institutions. I need to wait a little bit before that. But I try to look more respectable uh, in a, well, a week or two. Good. Uh, so let's see. So let's finish this calculation, right? So we will have to compare these two terms here. In other words, the equation is 1 plus f prime square is 1 over 1 minus 2m over r. So, uh, we do our usual trick to reduce this equation a little bit. Um, so this is going to be multiplied by r, r minus 2m. Uh, then I can make a 1 up here by writing minus 2m plus 2m. And uh, so this is 1. This is 1 plus 2m over r minus 2m. So the 1s cancel out nicely. And so if I take a square root, and uh, well, I'm going to have two signs. f prime is plus minus square root of, of this, 2m over r minus 2m. So you're going to help me integrate here. So you do the integral while I'm erasing this part uh, of the blackboard. Uh, well, I still need pieces of this, so, so let me not erase yet. Um, okay. So help, what's f? Shouldn't be that difficult, should it? Let's see, there's certainly a square root of 2m, and there's certainly a plus minus, okay? So this one is easy. And uh, I have to integrate 1 over square root, so I get... Uh, nobody wants to help me? No? Okay, thanks. Okay, 1, 2m, and the factor like that, something like that, right? So that's the formula, and f is, uh, this is z, right? Because this is our embedding equation. So sigma is z equal f of r, so z is f is this. Good. So we have uh, an equation which, written like that, is not very enlightening, but so if... Should it not be factor 2 each integral 1 half? Because when you're adding... For the right. Factor? Okay, of course it is. Thank you. So, if I restore my mistake counter, it's, number, it's 2 now. Good, so times 2. So... Uh, so z is equal this thing. So let's square this so that we see a little better what's happening. So we get z square is equal uh, 4 from this and 2m from this, so 8m r minus 2m. Right? 
right? And, of, and it's actually equivalent because I have a plus minus here, so taking the square root uh, is okay. Well, there might be a restriction here, of course, then r is uh, louder than 2m. We always had this anyway, right? So r is louder than 2m. Um, and if I, uh, I can write this equation as r is equal to m plus z square over 8m. Let me check that I have the 8 here. I vaguely thought maybe I have a 4, but it's probably correct with the 8. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So uh, what is this uh, set, right? So R is obviously louder than 2M because this is positive and, um, and uh, Z, um, well, so we have the surface uh, here, and let me just uh, uh, try to draw it in. Uh, I don't have enough room. What do I do? Uh, let's try to to make a, a quick drawing like that. So this is the z-axis. This is the r-axis, and. Uh, well, one can view z, uh, z as a function of r with the square root. Uh, so we start at 2m, and we get the square root function here. But actually, it's much nicer to view r as a function of z, because then it's clear that this is a smooth function. Here, well, obviously, the function z of r is not smooth uh, at r equal to m, but viewed as a graph over the z-axis, we get a nice parabola, right? So we get just a parabola here. Right, so this is um, this function here. And now you have to remember that this is only the, uh, this part, uh, part of the metric. Uh, there's also the sphere part, so we have to rotate this uh, on a three-dimensional sphere. This is difficult to draw, but uh, we can probably attempt to draw it uh, as a, if it were in a, with one dimension more. So if we just multiplied it by a circle S1 and rotate it along this axis, then we get a paraboloid in a four-dimensional space, right? So this would be the two-dimensional version of the flam paraboloid. The flam paraboloid is a three-dimensional hypersurface in four dimensions. This would be a two-dimensional flam paraboloid in three dimensions. So, but this is precisely our Einstein-Rosen bridge, right? Because that's a uh, we had a branch r louder than 2m that we extend to a negative region uh, in the row coordinates here, while this embedding extends just by itself uh, the, the whole thing. Um, in an obviously smooth way, right? So the geometry induced on the constant time slices in the Schwarzschild metric looks like a paraboloid in four dimensions. Good. So this was the flam paraboloid part. Uh, that's going to be a very short section. Uh, we're going to go to a longer one right now, which is uh, the, well, slightly longer one, which is the Penrose diagram. So Penrose diagrams is just a variation on, on, the, on this picture here. 
So I'm not doing much anymore. I'm not extending the geometry or anything like that. What I'm going to do is just to uh, re, uh, change coordinates to uh, get a nicer picture or a simpler or a more user-friendly picture of, uh, of this kruskal sekeres extension. So today is disaster upon disaster because I see I'm going to run out of water before the end of the lecture. So uh, at some stage, one this lecture will just collapse by itself, and uh, you you won't have to worry about uh, us doing anything more. Well, let's see how long it lasts. So. Good. So our next paragraph, which is according to Eva's counting for eight, is the conformal Carter Penrose diagram. I've told you Penrose diagram because that's what everybody uses now. Uh, apparently, this Penrose diagram was first discovered, presented, introduced by Carter, and he called them conformal diagram. So, standard terminology is Penrose diagram, but if you say conformal diagram or Carter diagram, that works as well. And our aim is to obtain the following picture. Which is a scaled version of, of this one, right? So, uh, so scale transform the KS picture. To this one. So now this set r equals 0 is going to be mapped 
to this one. And so again, it's usual to make it bold or wiggly or something like that uh, to make clear that this is a singular boundary. Uh, R equal to M is what you think it is. So this is R equal to M. Yeah? And now these boundaries are very useful uh, and they're called infinity. So because R goes to infinity here and here and, uh, and here as well and here as well. Okay. So you have these uh, Everything has been stretched down to a finite distance. And there is a very uh, useful uh, corollary to that, because if you start to think about causality, uh, what happens with light cones uh, in these space times, then uh, here you've condensed everything to a finite picture. So you don't have to worry what happens with light cones or causality when you go far to infinity, you don't see it here, right? I mean, there's no enough, not enough room. Here, everything has been um, uh, condensed to a finite uh, region. So the idea is first uh, use a, obtain a finite region, right? Finite subset of a plane. and preserve the conformal uh, aspect of the metric. So let me just explain what I mean by this. Conformal. Conformal means up to a factor, right? So you just take a metric, multiply it by something you call this a conformal factor. The conformal properties of, of the metric, uh, well, written in uh, one or two, right? In one or two. So in other words, this two-dimensional metric uh, is a flat metric times a function. And so then you say it's conformally flat, right? Up to a function, a positive function, well, uh, I probably have the signs wrong here, do I? Yeah, I think the signs here were plus minus. So in other words, uh, uh, this is correct when you introduce, when you, uh, yeah. So, so I think that the, the right signs here were, uh, were plus and minus. Shame on me. Third mistake today. Good. So, so in any case, right? So if you just include this minus here, that's the Minkowski metric, multiplied by a positive function. Okay, that's what it is. So this is this conformal property. And so what is the point? Uh, now there is a corollary of this. Uh, if you look at a metric which looks like uh, um, like one, uh, and take a Uh, causal vector, also yeah, causal vector, time-like vector. So you want that x has negative lengths and put it in the metric 2. Then this is uh, right, with the signs now which are correct, it's uh, this positive function psi, and we have minus the t component of, of this vector, plus the x component. Oh, x is not a good idea. 
because x was a coordinate here. So let's take a... I was wondering, when looking at my notes, why I used a, a weird symbol here. Uh, and then I understand now. I didn't use x. Normally, for a vector, I use capital X. So just thinking, what, why? Why not x here? So now I know. So uh, z t square plus z x square plus uh, this part, which is positive, right? So that's uh, r square. x uh, theta square plus sine square theta x phi square. Okay, so that's uh, the length of a <laughs> time-like vector, not x but z. Good, we'll get there. Let's go and count this as one half, uh, as I corrected it myself quickly. Uh, then, uh, so all this has to be negative, but this means that uh, since this is positive, then this better be uh, negative too, right? This is, the whole thing is negative, this is positive, so this has to be negative. So, uh, uh, is also time-like in the flat metric, uh, two-dimensional metric, right? Minus dt square plus dx square. Right, that, that's what the equation says. If the whole vector is time-like for the space-time metric, because this part is positive, and this conformal factor is positive, it has to be time-like uh, in, in this tx part, so in this two-dimensional metric, right? So if I have this picture here, and I look at light cones in this picture, then future time-like would be here, right? Or at this point, future time-like would be here. Or at this point, future time-like would be here. So, because this part is conformal to the flat metric and we've forgotten something positive, causal curves become to curves which have a tangent which is causal in this two-dimensional metric. Causal vectors are causal here, so causal curves have tangent which are well, which are time-like in this just normal Minkowski two-dimensional metric. So if I'm sitting at this point here and I want to see its future, then I have to follow curves which have time-like future-directed killing vector, so they can only remain in this region. A causal curve has to remain in the region because its tangent curve vector has always a slope which is larger than 45 degrees, lies in this cone. Right? So, so then I see that from this point, well, I can get to infinity with causal or no, uh, with causal curves. I can get to the black hole region with causal curves, but from this point I will never be able to get to this region, right? Because I have to move, I have to remain within this, this set here, and this set never gets here. So, uh, if I look at the same problem starting from a point here, then the analysis is obviously identical. Then, if I want to go to the future from this point, causality is the same as two-dimensional Minkowski space-time, then my futures look like that. Uh, I have to remain into my two-dimensional Minkowski light cone. So in this region, I can either stay in this region or go to the black hole region, but I will never be able to go to the white hole region. I will never be able to go to the 
other universe. So this Kruskal Sekeres manifold is a copy of two asymptotically flat regions, but they don't communicate with each other, right? So if you think about this parallel universe, which is somewhere out there, uh, well, so suppose that, uh, that we, we expect that Sagittarius A star is a black hole, right? And it has a, maybe a, so it's probably a little more complicated than this one because it's uh, a Kerr black hole. Uh, so the properties are a little more complicated, but essentially a lot of this goes through. So if this, in any case, if Sagittarius A star was a Schwarzschild black hole, and this is our world here, maybe there is an identical copy of our world on the other side of Sagittarius A star, where an identical copy of me is actually lecturing about uh, the geometry of the Schwarzschild black hole. And an identical copy of you is uh, looking at the lecture over Zoom. Uh, well, maybe, but there is no way to know. Uh, there's no way to know because uh, my other me cannot communicate with my me here. So this parallel universe uh, understood like that. And note this is not the same as the parallel universes in uh, cosmology or in the many world uh, theory where, uh, well, who knows here, who has already heard about every many world interpretation of quantum mechanics? Okay, so. Liam, can you, ask, can you tell, them, tell us about it? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a good way to verbalize it. Okay. And it's been a while, but more or less that since anything is going to make sense probabilistic, there isn't at any point where some, assuming some kind of states can happen, there is no other universe where the other sort of, you know, on a small level of spin state could have happened, which then can extend the extent to like in the pop science world, every decision there in the universe is somehow of majorly a uh, different type of decision due to other kind of like mathematical thing that I guess takes away in pop science to weird stuff. <laughs> Eva, what's your version of this? Can you tell us this again? I think that's about right, but uh, uh, Eva? Yeah, kind of like the, that, um, that if we have the probabilistic view of the wave function that when we measure it, it collapses. And that instead of saying, okay, it collapses into a state, that we say every result is realized in a different universe, basically. But it's, but it's just that. Right. So this is uh, another way of saying what Liam said, right? So that every so there's a silly idea that every time we, ha we make a measurement, right? It also has to be normally there's a notion of measurement involved. If you don't measure the system, nothing happens, right? But as long as you don't observe a quantum system, it just does whatever it wants to do. But the moment you observe it, it's going to split into an infinite number of copies, each for each probability, right? So each time we make an observation of our universe, there's an infinite number of new copies of our universe which split up with various different outcomes happening, right? So this has nothing to do with this, right? So here there's not infinite number of copies at every moment of time. Uh, there's just two copies that are there. And uh, of course they're vacuum, they're isometric, so it's not like a copy of me seeing here and there. But if you wanted to extrapolate in this way, you could, right? That you have an exactly isometric region on the other side of the black hole with everything uh, being isometric there. So if I'm sitting here, that's another me sitting there and so forth. Good. Anyway, so uh, yeah, coming back to this causality business, right? So you're sitting here, you can only move to the future as in Minkowski, because the metric is conformal to the two-dimensional Minkowski. So this is the future of this point. This is the future of this point. You can only move uh, along causal curves in Minkowski. 45 degree slopes for the light cones, right? So this equals zero means 45 degrees. And so if you're under the horizon, you can only fall into the singularity. 
if you are in the white hole region, uh, you can from this point go both to our world or to the other world or to the to the black hole region, right? So all these calculations and arguments with time functions and stuff about the global structure of this thing that we did to prove that the cross cal Sekeres extension is a black hole. Well, this picture is exactly the same as this one, but in a concise way. And all these causality properties, you just see them without even having to think about, right? Without even having to make arguments about time functions and stuff like that. Of course, uh, R is a time function, is uh, here, right? In increases along a future directed timeline curve. R is a minus time function here, but who cares? Right? You don't care about this. You just draw the picture and you know what's happening. Good. So this is our aim. And uh, this is the interest of this. And let's do it. So the construction. Uh, yes, so you want to shrink the u hat v hat coordinate system, which was taking an infinite subset of the two dimensional plane to a finite region, right? So, so this is the first point, finite subset. The second is that this should be conformal. And so the easiest way to do this is just to uh, use any function which shrinks minus infinity infinity to uh, a finite distance. Uh, here, there's a, you could use any function, but to get this nice picture, you just do the following. You replace the u hat v hat coordinate systems by some new coordinates, which, are, which I call u tilde and v tilde. And the equation is uh, arc tan or tan u hat tilde is uh, u hat and tan u uh, v tilde is v hat. Okay. So if uh, u hat v hat are in R, R square, then uh, uh, well, u tilde will be, uh, where will be u tilde and v tilde? With this, some help, please. So I can meanwhile erase this. Anyone can help me, please? Minus pi half, pi half. Right, right. Square, right? So pi half, pi half. And of course, uh, this is true if we just, uh, if u hat and v hat were just running over the whole plane. But we know they're not, right? We just need to work out what happens uh, with these uh, singularities. But so, yes, uh, pi half minus pi half pi half is your friend here.
So the annoying thing is that uh, when I have to erase this with paper, I'm going to use half of the Amazonian forest just to for my, each of my lectures, which is uh, an unpleasant thought. Uh, good, right? So, so now, th so we get uh, minus pi half, pi half times uh, minus pi half, pi half. Uh, but then uh, the condition u hat v hat should be smaller than one. Uh, than one. Right, this is our condition here, which I very dutifully wrote before my lecture because I knew I'm going to need it. Isn't this clever? Great teaching technique and so forth. <laughs> Good. You had we had smaller than one. Uh, let's see. So, uh, so this is the same as uh, tan. You had. Tan v hat uh, smaller than one, and you look at this equation. You think, "What the hell am I going to do with this? How should I know what this means?" So you think for five minutes, and either you ask Mr. Penrose or you think about uh, some elementary trigonometry, there's a formula for this. Let me see if I'm going to write it correctly. So I think that this, this function is actually equal to this one. Uh, Should be smaller than one. Uh, good. So maybe we should check this formula. Uh, it's not too difficult to check. Uh, maybe I leave it to you as an exercise. How much time do we have? Let's see if we have some time left at the end. We might do this, uh, but for the moment, let's leave it as an exercise. And. Uh, Let's look at the equality case. Uh, so this is equal to one. Uh, then you will get that cos u hat minus v hat minus cos u hat plus v hat. Uh, tilde, sorry, it's all tildes, is equal cos u hat minus v hat plus cos u hat plus v hat. Right, if this is equal 1, you multiply, and you're going to have this equation. This cancels out. Uh, this is twice the same. You get that cos u hat plus v hat is equal 0. And difficult equation to solve. Need help. Cos is zero, so u hat plus v hat is uh, how much? Plus minus pi half. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So u hat plus v hat is plus minus pi half. So here. We obtain this square. In the UV plane. Uh, and 
And this goes from uh, pi half to minus pi half. And u hat plus v hat equal pi half is actually this, right? Okay. So these are these boundaries. And the boundaries are the singular set, right? So this is the singularity. And now we, we want this product to be uh, smaller than one. So there are two possibilities. Either we're outside or we're inside. But uh, if you are at the origin, then this product is zero, right? So the origin is certainly in the set where the product is smaller than one. So this is our set now. So this is our set in uh, u hat v hat coordinates. But now if you want to go to uh, uh, not null coordinates, but coordinates of the spirit, you have to rotate this picture. Right? And if you have to rotate this picture, that's what you're going to end here. And so the last thing is to, to apply a rotation. Uh, actually, it's a homothety, but uh, never mind. And homothety. So we're going to say uh, T tilde is u hat plus v hat. And uh, x tilde is uh, u hat minus v hat. So this is a, a rotation which produces this picture here. Right, so, uh, so here. Uh, you ha this would be t tilde is, as this is a t tilde and x tilde plane. And here you have t tilde is equal minus pi half. And here uh, t tilde is t tilde is uh, pi half. Right. Okay. So this is this picture rotated. Uh, of course, you've, you've uh, stretched things which were at infinity to a finite distance. And so uh, you can just figure out that this corresponds to R going to infinity uh, and, and so forth. So now uh, the only thing I didn't, so, so I've told you the stretching, I've showed you that this picture is uh, this one here, right? So, so we have wrote, so this is this picture rotated. So this would be, uh, well, the u v axis would be here, right? So uh, u u tilde and v tilde axis are actually the zero are, are the horizons. Right? So let's rotate this. You're going to get that. And what about then? Uh, uh, whether the metric is conformal, right? So the only thing that remains to check is the conformal character of the metric. Um, I, 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 I need these equations here while I'm going to write them again.
Yes. So, you know, we can currently see ourselves in the cameras for some of the Zoom camera thingy you've got into the screen, and now it's got a nice infinity curtain. Aha. Uh -huh. What happened? Uh huh. How can I get rid of this? Well, one one, uh, the one option would be just to restart the whole thing. Uh, but I just don't want to do this. But thanks for pointing this out. Of course, it's nice to see yourselves, right? <laughs> Once in a while. But, uh, yeah, if you don't see the blackboard, that's uh, not very helpful, is it? <laughs> uh, let's see. What can I do with this? Terrible, terrible. Uh, Maybe there's like this desktop notification that's on the bottom right of the screen that we can see. I think that might be the thing that's forcing the, your screen in front of version or something. You think so? Maybe that's maybe it's just yeah. it seems to help. Uh, so of course when I was doing this I must have shaken something. Uh, question is what? Well, there is buttons here which uh, Look at, you know what, uh, let me just stop the lecture and restart it. And I, I forgot to record anyway. <laughs> so uh, let's see, so I'm going to, um, well this sounds like brutal, right? So, so now it's even worse, is it? Didn't help, right? Uh, let's see. Never happened to me so far. What could this be? Mm. Wait, if it's only the next five minutes affect you anyhow, the bit of <laughs> there's only five minutes left anyway. <laughs> right. But it's still annoying. Uh, how can I move this? Maybe you can minimize the window. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to do this, but so I, I can't really see it well. So what happened now? <laughs> Any change for you? No. Because now I don't see even anything now. It's just a blank screen. Uh, for me. Let's see if I do a pause of the light. Restart. Any change? Okay. Good, but you, you can still see what I'm writing here. <laughs> Good, Maybe okay. I could, I could go here, right? Yeah, okay. But you know, uh, let me just uh, fi finish. Yeah, indeed, five minutes is, I, I don't need more, right? So let's see. So uh, we had an equation u hat is equal. Uh, uh, how did it go, tan u tilde? So we get du hat is uh, cos u tilde uh, du tilde. Cos, why cos? Nonsense. What's the derivative of tan? You have to help me here. So tan prime, right? Tan of u prime. Good. So I'm going to write the V equation and meanwhile somebody figures out what's the uh, what's the formula for the derivative of tan. Well, 
One over cos squared. Thanks. Okay, so DV, I have something similar for cos square V. And uh, so uh, if I go to my uh, metric one, which you don't see anymore, but so let me write it again, therefore. So G was, so equation one was uh, this one. G is minus psi, and who cares what psi is? This was a positive function. Du hat, dv hat plus r square d omega square. Uh, then, uh, well, I have du hat and dv hat from this formula, so this is equal uh, minus psi uh, du hat dv hat over cos square u hat cos square v hat uh, plus r square d omega square. And good. And so this is the metric here. Uh, the function cos u in this domain, you can just check, right? So u and v are minus pi half pi half. So this is a positive function. So we have a new conformal factor times a flat metric in rotated coordinates. Uh, if you just want to make it completely explicit now, you make this last change of coordinates, which was, um, so u hat was, I'm really running out of time and place, so let me just do it here. So u hat was uh, uh, t hat. You can't quite see it that badly. You can't? That's okay. The That's the borderline. So yeah. let's do it here. Here is okay. <laughs> this is really ridiculous. Yeah, So, so let's see, we have this formula u hat uh, u tilde is uh, t tilde minus x tilde, v tilde is t tilde plus x tilde. So uh, I maybe, maybe I had something, uh, I, I need a two somewhere or something like that or whatever. So, so now, so du hat du, du tilde. Maybe there's a two wrong somewhere in my formulas, but uh, it's going to be uh, dt tilde minus dx tilde times dt tilde plus dx tilde, giving me dt square minus dx square. So this is now an obviously, um, obviously uh, Minkowski metric in two dimensions. If you include this minus sign here, and so, so this gives you the, the metric here. So uh, manifestly Minkowski metric times a conformal factor, uh, and, and that's the domain. So <laughs> apologies for this nonsense with the, uh, with the video. And uh, any questions? Good. So I'm... Happy I managed to survive with almost no water in the eraser and uh, no suction, but uh, <laughs> and another disaster at the end. I hope that next week is going to work better. See you next week. Bye bye.